flavor is in full bloom at HelloFresh. Enjoy the taste of spring with chef-crafted recipes featuring ripe seasonal ingredients delivered right to your door. Get 16 free meals plus free shipping with code MLM16 at hellofresh.com slash MLM16. I love a good pyramid as much as the next person. Well, maybe a lot more than the next person, but not when it's in the form of a pyramid scheme. Only good well-sourced pyramids are welcome here. And the one we're going to talk about today is actually pretty controversial, the food pyramid. To eat healthily, one must learn about the variety and quantities of the food we eat. We need to learn about the food pyramid and follow its steps. Here it is. If you're a millennial like me, then you were probably shown this model or some variation of it in school. It's pretty straightforward. Bread and grains are at the bottom, fruit and veggies above that, meat and dairy above that, and then fats and sugars at the little tippity top. And on the surface, this doesn't look like a bad idea. Everyone needs a good balanced diet and we don't wanna have too much sugar. That's a pretty basic thing to teach kids. And with such a simple visual, it seems like an effective way to teach it. A food pyramid is a visual tool that guides us about the entire healthy food intake that our body requires on a daily basis. It's not until you get into the servings that things start to really take a turn. You need, apparently, six to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta groups per day. Then three to five veggies, two to four fruit, two to three dairy, and two to three of meat and proteins. It seems like a lot of food, especially for a kid being taught this pyramid in elementary school. But when I was a wee babby triangle sitting in one of those awkward desk chairs and absolutely cracking my back on it and listening to my teacher explain the food pyramid, I didn't think they'd lie to me. And I'm not even saying they did lie to me. They may not have even known the truth about this. After all, this was introduced by the USDA by supposed professionals who surely had our best interests at heart. So if I've got to eat the equivalent of six to 11 cups of cereal every day, then I guess you gotta do it. And no, the truth is this sounds really off and that's because it is. In reality, the food pyramid was never meant to be this way. It was standardized by lobbyists. The original doctor that created it claimed the version introduced in the 90s is completely off the mark. And yet it's actually still widely regarded as fact. Sure, you can find articles speaking out against the mealtime myth, but it's not as if the videos I showed you hailing the Great Pyramid are even decades old. One was literally released less than a year ago. If there's one thing that I dislike the most, it's the mistreatment of such an important beloved shape. And that's why I knew I had to speak out and unveil this common food industry lie today on Multi-Level Mondays. So let's start from the top and the smallest part of the pyramid consisting of sweets and fats. While my triangular head has no problem staying upright, the food pyramid is wildly unbalanced. That's not to say that every single food group should be perfectly equal, not at all. But the way the pyramid is laid out, it's set up to demonize certain groups. As the Dr. Binox show put it, let's start from the tippy top with sweets and fats. Now the word fats alone implies that, yeah, you don't wanna eat too many of this particular food group or else you'll gain weight. But fats isn't just butter or lard or whatever might come to mind. It's also necessary for our body to function. Healthy fats, things that come from nuts, seeds, and fish are basically eliminated by the food pyramid. Fish and nuts are grouped in with the rest of meat, but they're not categorized as the healthy fats that we also need. When most people learn about this pyramid, it seems to be called the protein section. And yes, protein is important, but lumping all fats together as bad is also bad. PBS says that the food pyramid itself is based on this mindset. Fat bad, carbohydrate good. Their article says that the model was almost an accepted religious belief. That's how stringent people were about it. And people weren't really open to criticism about it either. This was the guideline and that's all there is to it. Don't question the food pyramid. But I dug a little bit deeper. Why the demonization of fats? And like most things I've researched, there's usually one common answer, money. Big surprise, I know. As it turns out, the sugar industry and the fat industry have an ongoing war for a while now, and the sugar industry fights dirty. 
Seriously though, the sugar industry has apparently influenced five decades of research into the role of nutrition and heart disease, completely derailing the discussion about sugar, according to Stanton Glantz, a professor of medicine at UCSF. The Sugar Association itself, quote, paid three Harvard scientists the equivalent of about $50,000 in today's dollars to publish a 1967 review of research on sugar, fat, and heart disease. The studies used in the review were handpicked by the Sugar Group, and the article, which was published in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, minimized the link between sugar and heart health and cast aspirations on the role of saturated fat. Their influence peddling is more than half a century old, and seeing as the New England Journal of Medicine didn't require financial disclosures until the mid-1980s, there was practically no transparency to be had. It's really difficult to have a productive conversation about sugar and fat and our health in general when so many years worth of studies may not be nearly as reliable as we think. So it's no wonder that fat has been so demonized. See, this is why we shouldn't make fun of avocado toast lovers. After so many years of being shunned and dismissed as bad, these healthy fats deserve a comeback. Avocados, you've earned that spotlight. But terrible jokes and whatever that I could make aside, this pyramid did contribute to the fat-free craze in the 1990s. There are a lot of different diets and health trends and options out there, but back then this model and new dietary guidelines when it was all released, Americans heard the fat is bad message loud and clear. Fat-free frozen yogurt, fat-free muffins and cookies flooded the shelves, fat-free everything was everywhere. And how did this benefit the sugar industry, you might ask? Because fat tastes good. And you know what else tastes good? Sugar. The formula for all these foods, according to NPR, was the same. Take out the fat, add lots of sugar. Delicious. Because, you know, demonizing an entire food group isn't a great idea, so Americans obviously started gaining weight and became even more diabetic. This doesn't mean that this shift in weight gain is entirely the fault of the sugar industry, and I also really don't want big sugar coming after me, but I do personally, in my opinion, believe that they do probably bear some responsibility. Not that there haven't been misconceptions surrounding sugar too. It's not like they're totally just evil and that's it. There's been problems there too. In the past decade or so, many Americans have switched to sugar-free sweets after being led to believe that those are healthier. And hey, if you're craving a soda and decide on the diet or sugar-free version, I'm not saying that's a horrible thing, but in many cases, that sugar-free label also doesn't mean much. Natural sugars, like those that come from fruit or fructose sweetener and fruit juice concentrates might still be present. No, the word fruit doesn't automatically make them healthy either. Sorry to burst your bubble there. Even sugar alternatives such as stevia have their downsides. Harvard Health argues that this replacement doesn't really promote a healthy lifestyle. Instead, some of the people having artificial sweeteners get locked into the mindset that since they're having a sugar-free soda, then it's fine to have a cake, quote. In other words, use of artificial sweeteners can make you shun healthy, filling, and highly nutritious foods while consuming more artificially flavored foods with less nutritional value. In fact, research has suggested that artificial sweeteners also prevent people from associating sweetness with caloric intake too. Since there's no sugar, have as many sugar-free drinks as you want, right? Yeah, that's the trick that Harvard Health says they're playing. And while this doesn't mean that sugar alternatives are bad, it doesn't mean that they're inherently healthy either. Basically, the misconception around fats and sugars has not served us well, but that's not all. This pyramid was ripe in more ways than one for some pretty nasty financial corruption. It's not only the sugar industry that has influenced the government's dietary recommendations. This is America after all, the land of legalized bribes. I'm mm, sorry, I meant lobbying. According to Dr. Marion Nestle, the chair of the New York University's nutrition department, the food pyramid was originally supposed to be released in 1991, not 1992, but the meat and dairy industries weren't too thrilled with how little their products were being recommended. Apparently on the original model, they were actually toward the top. Wanting more space, both industries began lobbying, delaying the pyramid's release. You might think that this is horrific and terrible and a recent revelation that has surely destroyed our conceptions about the food pyramid and what we were told during our childhoods, right? But the trouble is this lobbying was unveiled decades ago. It may not have been as well known as the model itself, but NCBI published an article about lobbying and US nutrition policy way back in 1993. 
And according to that article, federal dietary advice shifted from eat less meat in 1977 to have two to three daily servings with these new recommendations. Quote, Thus, this recent incident also highlights the inherent conflict of interest in the Department of Agriculture's dual mandates to promote U.S. agricultural products and to advise the public about healthy food choices. Sure, food groupings and USDA recommendations have been around for ages, but this conflict of interest reared its ugly head back in 1992 with the food pyramid, and it hasn't really gone away since. When the government released the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, we had the same issues. Though they claimed to be, quote, grounded in the most current scientific evidence, end quote, nutrition experts said that the guidelines were influenced too much by food manufacturers, food producers, and special interest groups. This goes beyond a food pyramid too. These guidelines are used to decide school lunch menus, public nutrition programs, food labeling, and medical research grants. Basically, if you hate that your precious angel little Timmy is eating chicken nuggets for lunch again this week, blame the lobbying. In my opinion, I think it's pretty messed up that food producers with an obvious inherent bias have any say whatsoever in nutritional labeling and guides, let alone this much. The governmental guidelines of all things should be something that we can trust to be impartial. I'm not surprised this happens. I don't think many of us would be, but it is still one hell of a disappointment. As for what was changed, time explained how heavy meat consumption can lead to higher rates of heart disease and cancer. Red meats were lumped in with processed meats and the advisory committee said that Americans should eat less of these foods such as salami and hot dogs. Yet the final guidelines put red meat right alongside poultry and seafood, only saying lower intakes of processed meats would be beneficial. And even then they stopped short of an explicit recommendation seemingly not taking the advisory committee's scientific report into consideration. But sure, these guidelines are based on science, right? Yeah, that's like saying carrot cakes are healthy because they have carrots in them. That's at least my opinion on it. Dr. Marion Nestle said, quote, there's a great deal of money at stake in what these guidelines say. And I was told we could never say eat less meat because USDA would not allow it. Now, this is actually similar to what we saw with fat and sugar. And even if the pyramid did go through some shifts in 2005, removing politics and lobbying from food recommendations in general is something that just isn't probably going to happen anytime soon. Not as far as I can tell. Some even say that it would be wishful thinking to hope for such a thing. Conflicts of interest and political pressures are absolutely everywhere. Besides, if we're talking about the food industry, lies and twisted truths have been around forever. But how did it get this bad in the first place? What was the magnificent food pyramid supposed to be? Dr. Louise Light is the OG nutritional expert and she was behind the food pyramid's creation. But don't grab your torches and pitchforks. She never wanted it to be this way. There have been a few images floating around of what the original pyramid was supposed to be. But one thing's for sure, lobbyists absolutely bastardized the thing. USDA nutritionists called for five to nine servings of fruits and veggies, but the USDA said, no, two to three would be just fine. Less than half the amount. While the grain recommendation three to four was doubled and nearly tripled, she added, quote, Moreover, my nutritionist group had placed baked goods made with white flour, including crackers, sweets, and other low nutrient foods laden with sugars and fats at the peak of the pyramid, recommending that they be eaten sparingly. To our alarm in the revised food guide, they were now made part of the pyramid's base. This doesn't mean that the USDA was recommending bad food necessarily. I don't wanna classify foods as good or bad. You do just need a variety to get your nutrients in every single day. And while this was literally Dr. Light's job, ensuring Americans got those nutrients, the USDA, quote, assaulted her dietary logic. Those are her words, not mine, but I think they're good ones. Light also said we should eat less processed foods, but the USDA changed her wording to avoiding too much of them. I suppose you could argue that they have similar meanings, eat less and avoid too much, but there's no arguing that they've got different connotations. Like if someone actively has a harmful habit, you would encourage them to cut back instead of passively suggesting, oh yeah, just don't overindulge, lol. Wording is important. And while I don't solely place blame on the pyramid for so many Americans struggling with their weight, it certainly doesn't help them either. No big deal though. Just have things that are whole grain for those you know, starch requirements and you'll be fine. Whole grain equals healthy, except for of course, when it doesn't. On children's cereals, which are notorious for being unhealthy and loaded with sugar, 
manufacturers have taken to printing whole grain, fiber, and organic on those boxes. Studies have shown that this has actually been effective. Parents that want their kids to eat healthy in the morning are more prone to buy those cereals. But these claims are extremely misleading. Maybe a whole grain cereal is less likely to give your kid a cavity than Lucky Charms, I have no idea, but they can still have incredibly unhealthy levels of sugar and sodium. If you slather a piece of whole grain bread and marshmallow fluff, it's not as if your kid is getting a nutritious breakfast purely because they've got some grains in there. According to Scientific American, whole grain only needs to be 51% whole grain in it to be considered as such. The rest can be refined and it still fits the legal technical definition of the so-called healthy food. It supposedly spikes blood sugar just as high as refined grains can too. Remind me again, how is this so much better for you? But let's dig a little bit deeper still. Before the westernized food pyramid, there was actually another model, one created in Sweden in 1972. This was an invention of necessity as Sweden had high grocery prices at the time and their National Board of Health and Welfare used it as a way to tell people what foods were essential and what ones weren't. The triangular model was used to better visualize the portions. There have also been other models too, like the basic seven dietary circle. But what strikes me as so unique about the pyramid is it's really the first one I see where people's basic needs aren't a priority. Instead, our health came second to lobbyist needs. Their wants to be placed at the base of the pyramids with higher servings were met in spite of the nutritionist recommendations. And I think that's just plain gross and there's no other word for it. And I know what some of you might be thinking. Yes, the pyramid was revised in later years. The new 2005 pyramid was aimed to teach kids that both eating healthy and exercising gives you energy. But even if it did do that, the damage had basically already been done. Remember how we said the 1992 pyramid could decide what was in our schools and what food was pushed on people? Well, having typical junk foods advertised on television and empty calorie lunches doesn't exactly reinforce this new and improved pyramid. The Food Revolution Network published an article in 2009 stating that the meat served in US schools wouldn't even meet the quality or safety standards of fast food restaurants. And half the vegetables eaten by kids aged two to 19 were French fries. Now, things have improved since then, but we've still got a long way to go to undo the mindset so many Americans have around food. But that does sound like a bit of an insurmountable task. How exactly do we do it? And what exactly do we eat? Before we take a moment to take a look at some of the food industry issues, I just wanna have a quick break for today's sponsor. Spring is a time of growth and transformation, and Dipsy is here to help you explore the sensual side of things this season of renewal. With Dipsy's sexy audio stories, you can indulge in your blooming desires, newfound passions, and the thrill of taking risks. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. New content is released every single week, so in between listening to your favorite stories over and over, you can always find something new to explore. And one of my favorite sections in Dipsy are their sleep stories and wellness sessions, but they also have sexy stories you can read if that's more of your thing too. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com MLM. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash MLM dipsystories.com slash MLM. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I'm sure many of you seen the cost of everything. Literally everything is so expensive now. And so when you find a deal, a working coupon or whatever, doesn't that feel nice? Because then you can just allot a little bit of your money to some other expense that we inevitably have to pay for. Well, thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. And that's because Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. And it's super easy. You just do your shopping as normal. And when it comes time to check out, you'll see the Honey button appear and all you do is click apply coupons. It's gonna search for working coupons. And if it finds one, you'll watch the prices drop. And as always, I cannot recommend Honey enough for deals on pizzas when it comes to your D&D groups, your game nights, movie nights, whatever it is, when you need pizza, when you need food, clothing, tech, whatever the hell, Honey covers a lot of it. And they have found me amazing coupons. Like I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago, they found me a 40% off coupon. That was insane. I was like, I didn't even know you could get a 40% off coupon. I'm used to maybe seeing like a 10 or 15, maybe a 20 for going crazy, like a 30 if it's really special, but a 40 vibes. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari and save on the go. 
So if you don't already have honey, you could just be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. So get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash MLM. That's joinhoney.com slash MLM. The main thing wrong with the food pyramid is the fact that it exists in the first place. And what I mean by that is food is almost never a one size fits all type of situation. I'm sure we could all probably strive to eat a little bit more of broccoli now and again, unless you're allergic or some other specific health reason, but a model that works perfectly well for one person may be unrealistic for someone else. Just portion sizes alone proves that. There's no way someone with smaller portion sizes would be able to easily shove six to 11 servings of grains into their daily intake, while perhaps for another person that might be more reasonable. According to the experts, a good diet should be individualized. This goes for the food pyramid, but it also goes for trendy diets too. Paleo, keto, all of that may work for some, but not for others. Everything from your age, body composition, to stress levels and caloric intake goals can affect this. Using a pyramid of what you should eat every day for every single person in a country is, in my opinion, never going to work. However, though this model may be our focus for today, it's far from the only giant sin within the food industry as a whole. We spoke about artificial sweeteners, how fat was pretty wrongfully demonized and whole grains being only 51% whole grain. But the food industry as a whole seems pretty comfortable with selling us half-truths, whether that's greenwashing or calling foods natural. Just remember, arsenic is natural, but I wouldn't dare consume that. Hell, it could even be considered organic, but the words organic and natural aren't regulated by the FDA. The US Department of Agriculture does regulate the term organic on food labels, but this doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that they're healthier for you. There is only minimal, and I mean minimal regulation around the word natural when it specifically comes to chicken, but even then it's heavily misused. In fact, Consumer Reports has dubbed natural the most misleading chicken label in 2013, as it doesn't mean the chicken isn't receiving antibiotics or GMO or anything. It just means there's no artificial ingredients, added colors, and processing is minimal. You'd think that these are the basic requirements of a chicken, but the word natural slapped on it has led consumers to think that these are some fancy free roaming animals when that has never been the case. Maybe you're wondering just how many people believe this. Surely it's not that many. Out of all the respondents to consumer reports, almost half thought that natural meant raised outdoors, while a third thought it meant the same as organic. In reality, the word organic when it comes to chickens only means that they have been eating a vegetarian diet. Antibiotics are still allowed in some capacity with this one. Even for the no antibiotics label, there's no inspection process to verify that. Cage-free and free range also aren't as meaningful as you think as they can still be kept in a tiny enclosed space, mistreated and only allowed a tiny sliver of outdoor space to receive either or both of these labels. There's no standard for the outdoor area. And once again, there really aren't inspections. Honestly, I don't even know the point of these labels. Well, that's not true. The point is to look better to consumers to make you buy that product. We've become more aware of the mistreatment of animals and in an attempt to seem animal friendly, they make a bunch of claims and empty promises that many consumers don't know are completely hollow. And ironically, this actually makes consumers less aware than ever. In my opinion, we're worse off by taking these labels at face value and thinking, oh, no biggie, we've improved so much when the meat industry as a whole has done so little to improve. Those labels aren't even worth the paper they're printed on. Joanna Blythman, a writer for The Guardian, says this fake, quote, clean label behavior is happening all across the food industry too. Not only have consumers demanded free range, natural meat, but they're also looking for food without as many additives and ingredients, you know, natural cereal or snacks or whatever. According to her, while some companies have reformulated their products in a genuine and wholehearted way, others have, quote, turned to a novel range of cheaper substances that allow them to present a scrubbed and rosy face to the public. If you, for example, got a salami at the grocery store and it said it contained rosemary extract, maybe you wouldn't think anything of it. That's just an herb to make it more flavorful, right? It makes sense that this would be someone's first thought, but rosemary extract is also just a clean label substitute for one of those hard to pronounce antioxidants, like uh, this freaking word that I cannot say. It's butyl hydroxenol, B-U-T-Y-L-H-Y-D-R-O-X-Y-A-N-I-S-O-L-E. What a word. It makes salami last longer and the extraction is done with chemical solvents such as hexane, ethanol, and acetone. Quote, the extraction's connection with the freshly cut green and pungent herb we know and love is fairly remote. 
I'm confident that an average consumer wouldn't know this and is actually far more likely to read an extract of rosemary as something added for flavor than a preservative that's gone through a bunch of solvents. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that this is bad for you. It just means that the food industry is being purposefully deceptive and that's not much better. But what does all of this have to do with the main focus of today's episode, the food pyramid? Both are examples of the way the food giants play a role in what we eat. They influence recommendations and deceive us in grocery stores. Trusting them to tell us what to eat is a losing game. Instead, eat what gives you energy, keeps you healthy, and gives your body the nutrients it actually needs. The food industry is an absolute mess. And the pyramid model? Well, it's only the tip of the pyramid. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you spending a couple minutes of your time here with me today. I know there's a million and a half things you could be doing, and yet you were here. So thank you. And uh, as always, I appreciate your time here, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.